All right. Thank you, Igor. Um, thank you very much to the organizers for putting together such an awesome conference and for bringing here so many exciting people that I've been inspired by for a very long time. And I'll con join all the other speakers in wishing asymptotic freedom a happy birthday. I will join the other speakers in revealing my age by telling you that yesterday I remembered with David that one of the first things I remember about going to college is that the 2004 prize was awarded. So that was one of my first strong QCD-related memories. Um, all right, so I, I thought I would offer something about the phases of gauge theories and the phases of QCD in the context of the big picture. And in particular, I talk about Higgs and confining phases and the extent to which they are not separate. Um, and to the extent that this talk will not just be review, it will be based on joint work with our Baumic Institute postdoc, Poshan Sin here. Um, Poshan is still with us for a little while, and then he'll start a faculty job at King's College in, in London in a little bit. Um, and of course, since we're celebrating the discovery of asymptotic freedom, I should say, start by saying that, that that is really what enables us to explore QCD at extreme limits in extreme phases, very high temperatures, very high densities, deep in the Higgs phase. And that's what enables calculations in those regimes and forms the basis for analyzing the phase diagram. All right, so the first part will be a, a sort of broad brush review of gauge theory phases, and there'll be some connections to what Zohar just explained. So phases of gauge theory play a role in many parts of physics, not just the standard model, but in particular in the standard model. So in a loose sense that will make more precise, QCD is in a confining phase or a confining regime of an SU3 gauge theory. And the rest of the standard model, the SU2 times U1 part of the gauge group is Higgs or spontaneously broken to electromagnetism. So we already have the two most prominent gauge theory phases right there. Higgsing, of course, famously plays an important role in the theory of superconductivity as well, where in the simplest setup, electromagnetism is broken to some Z2 discrete uh, gauge group. And on this slide, the word phase was used casually, so it should really be in quotes. And it's not precisely defined. I just meant it as a substitute for regime. In order to get something resembling a sharp definition of a phase uh, and a sharp prediction for a transition between phases, one typically requires, in the spirit of the Landau paradigm, something like an order parameter and something like a symmetry, uh, a global symmetry, that acts on the order parameter and that can be broken or unbroken in different phases. And it's been known since the early days of QCD that the correct order parameters for gauge theory phases are loops, large loops, you know, large electric loops, but the most familiar ones, these are the Wilson loops, for example, in QCD. And in other theories, there can also be interesting magnetic loops, for example, in the theory of superconductivity. And there's the famous area law behavior of the Wilson loop, which decays exponentially in the confining phase of pure gauge theory signaling, um, right, signaling the confining phase. And the, 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 the partner, the symmetry partner to the, to the large loop order parameters are the generalized symmetries that Zohar reviewed in his talk. So the, in particular, in four dimensions, the one-form symmetries that act on those loops. And one-form symmetries are some kind of covariant generalization of the old center symmetries that just act on the thermal circle. So a simple example is pure SU3 gauge theory without matter of any kind is a Z4, is it, sorry, Z3 center symmetry that acts on Wilson loops. It's unbroken in the confining phase in the vacuum at low temperature. And if you study the theory at finite temperature, there's a sharp finite temperature phase transition, and that symmetry is spontaneously broken at high T. So here's the problem with fundamental matter. The beautiful symmetries that we heard about, the one-form symmetries, um, require non-generic matter. They require certain matter representations to be absent, either completely absent, or some kind of limit where you can take, for example, very heavy quark masses and the quarks disappear and you're left with some sort of theory with non-generic matter. But in kind of real QCD with real quark masses, that's not the case. We have very prominent fundamental matter present. And those 
kind of matter representations always break the one-form symmetries. Right? And this is famously related to the fact that in QCD with fundamental quarks, the Wilson lines can end on the quarks, and the confining strings can snap open, and there's no order parameter, no symmetry that allows us to sharply characterize confinement and the confining phase in QCD. So when people talk about trying to prove, in some rigorous sense, confinement in QCD, they need to confront this problem or this feature. And this feature is not just empty words. If you, for example, study QCD with fundamental massive quarks at finite temperature, it actually does not have a sharp finite temperature phase transition, unlike the pure gauge theory. And this can be studied on the lattice beautifully, which shows a smooth crossover. All right. Very good. So this uh, brings us to the kind of the main topic of the talk, which is Higgs confinement continuity. And, and this is a, something that is very closely related to the statement that theory with fundamental matter doesn't have uh, symmetries that distinguish the confining phase or that single out the confining phase. Of course, it's an easy, simple fact that if you add fu enough fundamental Higgs fields to a gauge theory, then you can you know, engineer some scalar potential that completely Higgses the gauge theory down to nothing, and you get a trivial, boring, gapped vacuum, with, which is absolutely featureless, and which in all ways resembles the vacuum we would find in the confining regime. And as I just reviewed for you, there are no symmetries of either ordinary kind or of these you know, generalized one-form uh, symmetries that would distinguish the Higgs phase from the confining phase. And what that naturally leads to um, is the idea that those two phases are not, in fact, distinct, that they can be continuously connected without a phase transition, and that there will be one giant, smooth, kind of Higgs confinement phase, um, which you could move around in. And this set of ideas kind of was made precise in the generalized orbit of Lenny Susskind. The most rigorous results come from uh, rigorous lattice inequalities, for example, the results of Fratkin and Schenker, and also of Banks and Rabinovich, who showed explicitly in certain lattice models that this picture is actually correct, that they, there's a single Higgs confinement phase without a transition. Um, and later, in, in other contexts, for example, in supersymmetric theories, where we can really explore the phases of interacting gauge theories very, very thoroughly, this was also seen to be the case. And for example, it's, it's emphasized in the review by Intrilligator and Zyberg on gauge theory phases and supersymmetric theories. And so, you know, there's ample evidence and there's a symmetry-based plausibility argument that this should be true and it's basically been elevated to a, to a standard dogma or to a standard lore. And I think this lore was kind of elevated to a principle by these authors who called it Higgs confinement complementarity. And since complementarity has been used for many other things, I'll call it continuity. All right. So this, this is the uh, sort of very bird's eye review of um, where Higgs confinement continuity sits in this larger problem of gauge theory phases. And today what I'd like to talk about are a set of examples where the kind of generalized Higgs confinement dogma fails. Um, and I'll show you simple models where you can see that it fails and then I'll try to explain why those models have these unexpected Higgs confinement transitions. Um, and the reason is not related to any new symmetry or its breaking, which would somehow put them in the context of some kind of Landau paradigm, but instead the, it's related to the fact that the Higgs and the confining phases that I'll describe for you are in what are called different symmetry protected topological phases, or SPTs, the, the abbreviation SPTs will appear all over the, uh, the, the place. And these are, if you wish, generalizations of Chern Simons terms, and also in the spirit of Zohar's talk, generalization of theta terms that you can keep track of and that will induce some unexpected jumps. So I'll re review that at some length. And I should also mention that th there's a relation to what David Kaplan talked about uh, yesterday. All right. And after talking through some relatively straightforward examples, I'll try to 
argue that this um, idea has some applications to QCD at finite baryon density, which if you um, don't remember is confining at low densities, but is actually in a color conducting Higgs phase at high densities. So this is the plan. All right, let me briefly review what are symmetry protected topological phases. Um, so the, the big picture comes from getting condensed matter where many examples were discussed over the years, the integer quantum Hall effect uh, and topological insulators and superconductors were mentioned by David. I think Zohar mentioned the Haldane chain. These are all in, in this class. And they're very closely related to anomaly inflow. In the classic example, the anomaly inflow involves local triangle type anomalies, but the more modern examples also have interesting global anomalies. And the most robust setting in which these have been studied is in the context of fully gapped phases of matter without any symmetry breaking, without any topological order, phases that you would normally characterize as, as, as boring, trivial, and featureless, unless you know to ask the right questions. Um, so these are naively trivial phases. Um, more recently, people have started to explore so-called gapless SPTs, or situations where these these uh, SPTs coexist with other gapless degrees of freedom. These are very interesting and more delicate, but the reason I'm mentioning them is because we'll encounter them in one example. So the sort of one word summary or the one word reminder what SPTs are is, is they're non-trivial topological actions or response functions for background fields, for non-dynamical background fields associated with global symmetries and in particular unbroken global symmetries. So let me explain that in a little more detail. Uh, very briefly, here's the quintessential example that is hopefully familiar to many of you. Uh, even though we'll be entirely in four dimensions for the, the talk, this is a two plus one dimensional example. If you have a gap system in two plus one dimensions that has a U1 flavor symmetry, an unbroken U1 flavor symmetry, then you can couple it, oops, then you can couple it to a background gauge field big A. And this big A is non-dynamical, it's a probe. And when you compute the partition function, the effective action, by integrating out all the dynamical matter, the effective action may or may not have a Trent Simons term for this background gauge field A. And if so, the coefficient K is necessarily quantized because you're in a fully gapped phase. Um, and if you encounter such a Trent-Simons term, then in Euclidean signature, because of the I in front of the Trent-Simons term, you get a contribution to the phase of the partition function. So the phase of the partition function, as a function of backgrounds, is a way of detecting these kind of Trent-Simons terms, or SPTs, more generally. Now, the reason why I'm reviewing SPTs in the context of this talk on gauge theory phases is that SPTs can be used to diagnose phase transitions that you would not otherwise be able to detect. And in fact, if you ever encounter a situation, for whatever reason, where you have two different phases labeled by different integer k, then in the, in the middle you must somewhere encounter a, a non-trivial phase transition. The, you don't know the order of the phase transition. It could be first order. It could be second order. Um, a simple example, which I think David reviewed in his talk, is a, is a, is a free massive Dirac fermion. Uh, which you can integrate out to get a jump in the Trent Simons term. And of course, in the free fermion example, the phase transition is actually second order because you go through the massless point, uh, but that need not be the case in general. All right, so this, is the, this was the detour into three dimensions. Now we're back in four dimensions for the remainder of the talk. And the simplest, least mathematically sophisticated analog of a turn simons term in four dimensions is a theta term. And I'll now try to briefly review the simple example and the simple setting in which we'll use theta terms as SPTs for the remainder of the talk. So consider a free vial fermion in four dimensions. This is a two-component fermion. I call it psi alpha here, not a Dirac fermion. And I write here the free Lagrangian and the mass. M is in principle complex. It was complex in Zohar's talk, and that was important. But as you reminded us, the time reversal invariant locus is, is the one where M is real. 
and time reversal or parity will play a very important role in everything that we do. And for either sign of the mass, the theory is gapped and completely trivial. And in fact, the two signs are related by an anomalous axial symmetry rotation. Um, but the axial symmetry has a mixed anomaly with background fields. In particular, it has a mixed anomaly with gravity. I'm talking about a single vial fermion here. So when you do have an axial rotation to rotate the positive to the negative mass, and you also turn on background gravitational fields, you will induce a non-trivial gravitational theta term that I've written down here. And I've normalized it in such a way that theta is 2 pi periodic, uh, at least for the types of theories that we'll be working with. And of course, you can also do this for other theta terms for, say, flavor symmetries. If you have a flavor symmetry, you can also turn on the background field, and then you can track the theta term for that. Very importantly, I'm not discussing theta terms for the dynamical gauge fields. These are only probe theta terms. In fact, I'll be trying to stay very, hard, very far away from the dynamical theta terms. Now, a theta term is not quantized, right? It's a continuous 2 pi periodic variable. Um, and part of the rigidity of SPTs and part of the utility in diagnosing phase transition comes from the fact that they're quantized. But if you insist on time reversal, then the theta term can only take on two non-trivial val values, 0 or pi, modulo 2 pi. And so effectively, it does become quantized. And so that means that you can use the theta term with time reversal as a diagnostic, as an SPT, and as a diagnostic for a phase transition. In particular, in the free fermion, of course, you have a massless point at m equals 0. And that's exactly where the SPT jumps from theta equals 0 to theta equals pi. Without time reversal symmetry, None of these things work. The theta angle isn't quantized, so there's no rigid notion of an SPT. And in fact, as you can see from the Lagrangian, if the fermion mass is complex, nothing prevents you from going around the massless point from positive to negative m through the complex domain and avoiding the phase transition. So that's why time reversal is crucial, even in this free example. All right. So this gravitational theta term will be the main workhorse SPT in everything that I will say. It's not the only interesting SPT in four dimensions. As I said, there are flavor theta angles. And you can also be more sophisticated and consider refinements of the theta angle when you study the theory on sufficiently complicated manifolds. And in that case, you actually get more than just a Z2 worth of information. You might get, for example, even a Z, something like a Z16. Uh, so you get more refined notions of an SPT. But Theta equals pi will be sufficient for what I'll discuss today. All right. Um, so let me make a comment on ordinary QCD and SPTs. And this is, I put this under the heading of the Waffa-Witten theorem, or Waffa-Witten positivity, which of course plays a crucial role in deriving QCD inequalities. And the Waffa-Witten theorems, or the, the Weingarten Waffa-Witten theorems, come from the fact that if you take QCD with a positive bare quark mass, and I put bare in parentheses here because there's been a lot of discussion about the sign of quark mass. I really mean quark mass it, given a suitable regulator the way that Waffa and Witten discussed it. Um, and when you take the quark mass to be positive, you can regulate the QCD path integral in such a way that the measure is positive. And so this involves all sorts of choices. It involves setting all theta angles to zero, but you can do it in, in a consistent way, and then the path integral measure is positive. And in fact, the measure positivity doesn't just hold in flat space or on simple manifolds. It holds even on complicated manifolds and, and in the presence of gravitational background fields because the gravitational coupling to QCD is completely vector-like. So it's just like the, the one of the actual gauge fields. Now, if you have a positive definite path integral measure, then any partition function that you compute will necessarily be a positive number. And I've told you that to detect an SPT, you should look for phases in the partition function or signs. And so you will not find any such sign or phase in any model that actually respects the positivity assumptions of the buffer width theorem. So we'll have to somehow break those assumptions. And we'll do it in two different ways. We'll do it using Yukawa couplings. And we'll doing, do it using a finite chemical potential. And we argue that both regimes lead to interesting SPTs. All right, any questions so far? So let's look at some 
progressively more complicated examples of Higgs confinement transitions that can be detected using SBTs. So this is a simple example with SU2 gauge group, which is based or motiv it's motivated by the basic example used by Demopoulos and collaborators in their paper on Higgs confinement continuity. It's, it's basically SU2 QCD with a single Dirac flavor, except because it's SU2, I'm writing the single Dirac quark as two vial quarks, psi alpha, and I have a gauge group, which is SU2, and I put the gauge group in red, and so the red index A running from one to two is the gauge index, and then this theory also has an SU2 flavor symmetry, and for that there's a blue I index running from one to two as well. Um, and then I add a Higgs field to the theory, and the simplest Higgs field that I can add here is a um, Higgs field in the fundamental of SU2 gauge, but just like in the standard model, the SU2 flavor symmetry pops out as a custodial symmetry, so I'm gonna take that along for the ride. I'm gonna take the Higgs to be a real vector representation of SO4 or, or a bifundamental representation of SU2 color times SU2 flavor. And the basic ingredients for the Lagrangian are, are so basic that I'm not even gonna bother writing them out. There's a QCD Lagrangian for the quarks. Here, here are the quark masses. There's a Higgs Lagrangian, including a potential, which I'll not write explicitly. And the main, the main star of the show is going to be the Yukawa coupling. Here is the first non-trivial Yukawa coupling that you can write that respects gauge and flavor symmetry. And in this model, it's actually an irrelevant operator. It's a, it's a dimension five operator. In fact, it's basically the Weinberg operator uh, from the standard model. But the fact that it's irrelevant will not bother us. And in general, those Yukawa couplings are com complex as they are in the standard model. But here we're gonna insist on time reversal symmetry for the purposes of this toy example. And that implies that both the quark mass, MQ, and the Yukawa couplings, Y1 and Y2, have to be real. And uh, in principle, you could explore any sign, but for reasons that we've already discussed, we'll take positive quark mass. This is the regime where A, the waffle witten theorem holds, and B, we stay away from the genuine time, spontaneous time reversal breaking in Zohar's talk that occurred at sufficiently large negative quark mass. And you can also explore the different signs of the Yukawas, and here I've chosen, just for illustration, to take them both positive. <coughs> All right. So this model is easy to analyze. We're gonna take decoupling limits. In the limit in which the Higgs mass is large and positive, we throw it out, and we're just left with ordinary QCD. And as I've tried to argue for you, the waffa witten positivity of QCD means that this is our trivial, boring reference SPT with respect which we will measure all other SPTs. Maybe one thing I should say, if it hasn't already been mentioned, maybe by Zohar, is that, that SPTs are really a relative concept. You can always modify a given phase by adding counter terms. What really matters is the jump in an SPT as you go from one phase to another. So in particular, we'll be interested in the jump of the SPT as we dial from the confining uh, phase with large positive Higgs mass squared to the Higgs phase at large negative Higgs mass squared. So let's look at that jump. In deep in the Higgs phase, right, making the Higgs math large and negative, deep in the Higgs phase, this Higgs field will get a VEV, and in this simple model, it's almost accidentally a color flavor locking VEV, but color flavor locking will feature in all of our other examples as well. And the SU2 to gauge group is completely Higgs by this, There's a because the, the H is a fundamental Higgs field, but because of color flavor locking, the SU2 flavor symmetry actually manages to be completely unbroken, because essentially it mixes diagonally with the gauge symmetry. So you identify, after Higgsing, the gauge and the flavor indices. So this is a completely gapped and featureless and boring Higgs phase, just like we're used to. And because of color flavor locking, you can decompose the quarks, which were a bifundamental of color and flavor, a, you now identify the gauge index with the flavor index, and then you decompose it, and you get a singlet and a triplet. And I didn't even bother writing down the explicit masses for you in this model, I'll do it in the next model, but what you find is that deep in the Higgs phase, the Yukawa couplings contribute a Majorana mass to the fermion, and the triplet flips sign, while the singlet does not, relative to the confining phase. So there's a sim sim simple sign flip of an odd number of Majoranas, and because the theta angle was sensitive to the number of Majoranas mod two that flip sign, here you get theta gravity equals pi, deep in the Higgs phase. 
So this is a model where the confining and the Higgs phases are gap trivial, featureless, and boring. But if you ask, ask what is the response to turning on a gravitational background field, one of them has theta gravity equals zero, one of them has theta gravity equals pi. So there's necessarily a phase transition between them. And it's an unexpected phase transition from the point of view of anything resembling a kind of Landau paradigm for symmetries. This is standard for SPTs. This is true for all SPT enforced transitions. All right. Maybe one comment I would like to make. Just like for the fermion mass, time reversal is absolutely crucial for forcing this transition. If we break time reversal by allowing the Yukawas to be complex, we can, again, go around the transition in the complex plane and avoid it. So that goes a long way to explaining why these two phases still look very, very similar, even though I've just told you that there's a phase transition between them. You might have expected that that means that they're radically different, but they are, in fact, very similar, and people have spent a lot of time pointing out the similarities. I'm not going to go through that, but this is part of the reason. So unless you have a good reason to insist on time reversal, symmetry, these phase transitions shouldn't bother you too much. Um, one thing I would like to refer to in this context is that I've just tried to argue for you, for you that given the assumption that the confining phase is trivial, the Higgs phase is an SPT, and there's very nice recent work by my now colleague Ryan Thorngren and his collaborators who also looked at examples where you, would, you can have Higgs phases that are non-trivial SPTs. Uh, the difference between what, what we're doing and what they did is that they had symmetries of this one form type, of this higher form type, which I've reminded you in the beginning are absent in QCD with fundamentals. So we use only the SPTs that are there even for free fermions, just the, the ordinary flavor symmetries and gravity and time reversal. All right. So here's our next example. It'll be very similar, but it'll have a few new features. You take SU3 gauge theory, you basically start with ordinary three flavor QCD. SU3 gauge theory with three flavors of Dirac fermions, or in my vial presentation, six vi pairs of vial quarks that are called the vial pairs psi and chi bar, or psi and chi. A and I are color and flavor indices running from one to three. And we start with exactly the same theory. We take QCD with positive quark mass. And I'll consider, for simplicity, the flavor degenerate case, even though it's easy to consider other cases as well. So there's a U1 baryon number symmetry, and there's a Gelman SU3 flavor symmetry. All right. And we'll add, just as before, a Higgs field, which we again take to be a bifundamental of both color and flavor. And we add a suitable potential that I'll not spell out. I'll just tell you what the VEV is in the Higgs phase. And then we add a nice set of Yukawa couplings. And here I spell them out for you. Uh, here's the Higgs field, which is bifundamental in, or anti-bifundamental in color and flavor. Here is a certain diquark operator, which I've contracted with epsilon symbols in both color and flavor. And so this is a color and flavor anti-symmetric channel. And I put a Yukawa coupling in front. Turns out you can always take the Yukawa coupling to be real and positive if you insist on time reversal and parity. And so this is a, basically a, a channel in which this Yukawa coupling wants to pair dye quarks in a color flavor anti-symmetric channel. And this, this pairing was not picked at random. This pairing was picked by analogy with high density pairing in QCD, which we'll get to next. But for now, this is just another Higgs-Yukawa model. And it's, uh, the analysis of this model proceeds exactly as the SU2 model. So in the large positive Higgs mass regime, you land on ordinary QCD, and you have a trivial SPT. Deep in the Higgs phase, we're going to engineer a suitable scalar potential that again lands us on a color flavor locked Higgs VEF of this type. The difference is the, the delta function identifying color and flavor is the same, but now in this theory, my Higgs field is complex. It actually carries baryon number. Um, and so this VEV V here can be an arbitrary complex number. The SU3 breaking pattern is exactly the same as before. The SU3 gauge group is completely Higgsed. The SU3 flavor symmetry is unbroken by color flavor locking. But this one has a new feature. Because the Higgs VEV carries baryon number, and the determinant of H is a gauge invariant and SU3 flavor invariant operator, 
that gets a VEF in the Higgs phase, you actually break U1 baryon number spontaneously. So this is a U1 baryon superfluid, if you wish. There's a massless number Goldstone boson uh, for U1b, and otherwise the theory is gapped. So if this reminds you of high density QCD, that's not an accident. Because this theory was basically cooked up to look like the Higgs phase of high density QCD. All right. So I spent some time reviewing for you SPTs, and I stressed the importance of the gap in making sense of them. And then I said that if you relax the assumption of a gap, you can still try to discuss SPTs, but things get a little bit more delicate. And this is a relatively new and emerging subject, so there's things to be understood. But there, there are certainly situations when the closing of the gap threatens the SPT, because the gapless fields can be used to essentially absorb the background, for example, the background theta angle that I was talking about. You can try making a field redefinition of the dynamical gapless fields that will just eat the SPT, and then it becomes meaningless. But there are also examples where this doesn't happen, and one has to uh, more or less understand on a case-by-case -case basis when the SPT is meaningful and when it's not. So the question is, does the fact that we have a U1 Goldstone boson here for baryon number, does it threaten the meaning of the gravitational SPT that we've been discussing? And in these kind of examples, it's believed that the only way in which the Goldstone boson can eat the SPT is if the U1 symmetry that shifts the Goldstone boson actually has a mixed anomaly with gravity. Clearly, if there is such a mixed anomaly, then you can see how the SPT is eaten, because then there's a kind of a pi R wedge R coupling. Right? The Goldstone boson acts like an axion for gravity, and then you can just shift the Goldstone boson and cancel the R wedge R. Uh, but we are talking about a Goldstone boson for a baryon number, which is vector-like and has no mixed anomalies with anything interesting, certainly not with gravity. And therefore, we believe that this is actually an example where it makes sense to consider the question of what the gravitational theta angle is, even though there is a gapless Goldstone boson. And in fact, I'll give a consistency check of this very soon by showing you how to gap out the Goldstone boson without ruining the SPT. All right. So we'll get to the, uh, the, the SPT in a second. Let me uh, remind you what happens to the fermions. The, the idea is very, very simple and, and completely analogous to the SU2 example. We have bifundamentals under SU3 color and SU3 flavor, right? both the psi's and the chi's, and the fermion pairs. And then when we identify color with flavor, then we have a 3 times 3, and that decomposes into an octet and a singlet of the unbroken SU3 symmetry. And that happens both for the left-handed and the right-handed quarks. So there are two singlets and two octets. Yes, please. No, SU3 is an unbroken flavor symmetry. Yeah, only SU3 color is gauged. This time, I'll actually write down the mass formula for you. The uh, singlet mass is given by the quark mass plus or minus 4 times the Yukawa coupling times the VEF. And this M3 should really be M8. It should be the octet mass in this example. I made a mistake here. And the uh, octet mass looks very similar, except that you have a factor of 2 in front of the Yukawa contribution instead of 4. This is the typical factor of 2 that one gets between the singlet and the octet in the color flavor locking phase of this theory. Now, because of this uh, minus sign here, both in the singlet and in the octet channel, if the VEVs are very, very large, there's going to be one singlet Majorana fermion and one octet Majorana fermion that jump sign. So altogether, nine out of the 18 vial quarks that are in the theory jump sign, and that's an odd number. And therefore, you get theta equals pi for gravity. You also get a flavor SPT, but I'm, I'm going to set flavor aside to make things a little bit simpler. So the high, the, the deep Higgs regime of this theory is actually a gapless SPT with a Goldstone boson and with a gravitational theta angle of pi. Now I promised you that I would tell you what happens when we explicitly break baryon number. This, this serves two purposes. First of all, it will give us another nice example of a kind of putative Higgs confinement continuity that is ruined by SPTs. And secondly, it'll be a kind of robustness check on, on the whole picture. 
So you can break the U1B symmetry explicitly by adding the order parameter for U1B breaking, the determinant of H, explicitly to the Lagrangian. And deep in the confining phase, this doesn't do anything. You can integrate out the H, and it will be replaced by some sort of very irrelevant six-quark operator. But deep in the Higgs phase, it has the effect of lifting the Goldstone boson and giving it a mass. And you can do this in a way that preserves time reversal and parity. It only breaks U1 baryon number. So that means that you now have a situation where the confining phase is gapped and trivial. The Goldstone boson in the Higgs phase has been lifted, so that's also gapped and trivial. And before knowing anything about SPTs, you might have said that they're the same phase. But in fact, the jump in the gravitational theta angle is just as it was before. Now there's no discussion about whether or not the Goldstone boson imperils it. And therefore, you have, again, a non-trivial kind of SPT-enforced Higgs confinement transition. Um, and one small comment that I wanted to make here is that because we're talking about the gravitational theta angle, this SPT is very robust. For example, it doesn't care about whether the quark masses are really exactly degenerate and whether we have SU3 flavor symmetry. Yes? Fermionic. No, I've normalized my theta angle correctly for spin manifolds. So, so this is, a, a, this, the entire discussion is on spin manifolds. I'm just worried that uh, the only fermions in the small, like the fermions are very young. So, uh, we might need to watch when we're not No, the, the moment, first of all, I'm staying on spin manifolds, and that's enough. And, and the second statement is, is that the moment you introduce Higgs fields, that transforms in the same color representation as the fermions, you actually lose the identification of baryon number and fermion number. So this is this. Well, this this SPT, you're you're asking about a possible refinement that might give us more information. I'm saying we already get some information if we just consider spin manifolds. I, but I absolutely agree that we might learn more by considering non-spin manifolds also, which is possible in QCD, but not here. Yeah. But nothing forces me to consider more exotic manifolds. If I learn something with a simple set of background fields, then, then that's not a... Correct. Well, I think it's a good model for a particular regime of QCD. I don't think it's a good model for QCD everywhere. And the answer will be because, because all the um, uh, states that violate the spin charger relation will be very heavy in that phase. We don't, we don't care. All right. Good. So this uh, concludes my example, uh, my, my list of sort of simple higgs yukawa examples. And, and the, for the rest of the talk, I wait five minutes. I will say a few words about QCD at finite density. A very brief reminder of what is known about um, finite density QCD. Again, assuming for simplicity the SU3 flavor symmetric case with generate quark masses. Um, at sufficiently uh, large chemical potentials for baryon number, roughly around baryonic densities, it's believed that there's a phase transition to a, a U1B breaking superfluid phase. This happens at low enough densities that you might try to call this the confined regime. And then this regime is believed to be smoothly connected to the very high density phase, which is a Higgs phase, as I'll briefly review. And um, Thomas Schaefer and Frank Wilczek con actually could made explicitly this conjecture that these two regimes are uh, smoothly connected. They call it quark hadron continuity. It's an example of Higgs confinement continuity. All right, and very briefly, the ultra high density Higgs regime of, of the, th uh, the theory looks basically the same as the Higgs phase of our higgs yukawa model, so I won't say too much about it. I mean, uh, basically because of asymptotic freedom, single gluon exchange in the exact color flavor anti-symmetric channel that I was discussing before le leads to pairing, di-quark pairing, and the di-quark operator that condenses is here. It's basically an operator that has exactly the same quantum numbers as my fundamental Higgs field in the other model, and it gets a color flavor locking VEV. And because the symmetry breaking pattern is the same, many, many consequences are also exactly the same. It's a 
total Higgs phase, the SU with three flavors, symmetry is unbroken, U1 baryon is spontaneously broken, and so forth. The exact sizes of various gaps are not the same. Those are not universal. For example, Son showed us how to calculate the singlet and the octet gaps, and they have this interesting uh, e to the minus one over g enhancement. All right. So the question arises whether the two Higgs phases that we've been discussing, which look so similar, are in fact actually the same. So you know, is the high density phase of QCD and the deep Higgs phase of this higgs yukawa model that I was telling you about the same? And in particular, is it the same as far as the SPT is concerned? Is it true that theta gravity equals pi in both models? And we think that the answer is yes. First of all, both of them are weakly coupled Higgs phases. So you really should be entitled to answer this question completely reliably at weak coupling. This is not a strong coupling problem. And the SPT in this regime is really only sensitive to the fermions. You can notice that I've only used essentially free fermionic concepts to talk about the SPT. They're just theta angles that come around when you rotate fermions by, by phases. And the fate of the fermions, the physical fate of the fermions in the two models are, are the same, except you, roughly speaking, encounter them in reverse order. In finite density QCD, you first put a large chemical potential, then you get a Fermi surface, then you get pairing in this nice color flavor anti-symmetric channel, and that leads to gaps for the fermions. And in the other model, which is a model that I actually discussed at zero density, you just go to the Higgs phase, you get exactly the same uh, set of gaps, um, the, you, you get pairing in exactly the same channel. And then, if you wish, after the gaps have been created, you can turn on a chemical potential as well to see what happens. But once you've actually created the gaps at zero chemical potential, turning on finite density doesn't close them anymore. You can smoothly increase the chemical potential, and you will not encounter a massless fermion anymore. So the hope is that these two things basically commute, and that we end up reliably with the same uh, SPT phase, theta equals pi, in, in those two phases. And you can actually explicitly try to make a deformation argument connecting one to the other, and the deformation argument interpolates between one phase and the other while keeping all the fermion gaps uh, away from zero. You do have to close some bosonic gaps, but the fermions stay fixed. All right, so let's, for the last few minutes, briefly contemplate what would be the implications of such an SPT with theta gravity equals pi in the deep high density regime of QCD. Right? So the question that you would, imagine you would believe that theta g equals pi in this high density regime, in this Higgs regime, what happens in the remainder of the phase diagram? Is it possible that this regime smoothly persists down to low densities, or is there actually a new phase transition that we don't know about? I should say that Sherman and collaborators have very nicely suggested that there might be such a phase transition, but their arguments involve vortices, and as far as I can tell, uh, they don't have anything to do with the SPTs that I'm discussing. So that is a sort of different line of reasoning. I'll be trying to analyze what happens with these SPTs. And I would like to suggest that there could be a scenario in which there's an interesting new phase transition here in the middle of the superfluid phase where the gravitational theta angle jumps from pi to zero. And the reason you might believe that is that the standard simple picture that people sort of subscribe to for what happens at the superfluid transition is that the octet baryons pair into what uh, Bob Jaffe called the H dibaryon, which is a scalar, a flavor, neutral scalar of baryon number two that then condenses to break U1 baryon. But because it involves only the baryon octet, that's an even number of fermions, and that only gives you theta gravity equals zero. To get theta gra gravity equals pi, you roughly speaking need a ninth fermion to jump, and the octet is not enough to do that. And so the question is, what, what could do it? Well, one option that might still have a kind of hadronic or baryonic or confined description is, is, is a, uh, an, an exotic spin a half singlet baryon. But if there is such a spin a half singlet baryon, it would have to be some sort of heavy excited state in the quark model. And if such a state exists at all, it's presumably quite a bit heavier than the octet baryons and would presumably kick in at higher densities. So if you subscribe to this picture, you might be tempted to speculate that there's a new scale here, which I called mu SPT, at which whatever makes theta jump from zero to pi kicks in. And presumably, it's at a higher scale 
than the superfluid tra transition that's dri driven entirely by the octet. So this is not a proof. This is just a suggestion, but it's a well-motivated suggestion given that we now believe that theta equals pi in this identity pair. In principle, it can. That's why I just made my cautionary remarks. All right, so that brings me to conclusions. Um, so the first take-home message is that Higgs confinement continuity can actually fail in examples in which the two regimes are in different symmetry-protected topological phases. And this is a very general idea, but I showed you some particularly simple examples where this happens. And I also tried to argue for you that one example is high-density QCD, which is supposed to have this gravitational theta angle, which is robust, for example, against SU3 flavor-breaking perturbations. Which should, that should be true even for general quark masses, because it's a statement about very high densities. And this, at the least, should motivate you to contemplate the possibility of unexpected phase transitions, which are not indicated by any symmetry breaking. And there are many things one could think about next, and we're thinking about some of them. Um, one, one thing that I find particularly amusing is the consequences of possibly having theta equal pi for neutron star interiors, because if you have a neutron star in which theta equals pi in the middle and theta equals zero on the outside, then you might have some boundary layer on which you need some interesting edge modes. And one might try to say something about them. No, theta is, I called it theta g. Theta is a theta angle for gravity, which I'm treating as a background field. Um, for the purposes of probing QCD, it's an entirely non-dynamical background field. You can ask how important is it in solving Einstein's equation in a neutron star, and probably the answer is not very important since it doesn't contribute to the equations of motion. Uh, but it might become important in this boundary layer. In the boundary layer in which theta jumps from zero to pi, there's roughly speaking a gravitational turn simons term on the three-dimensional transition region, and that can actually, that, that can actually contribute. Whether or not this is important, I have no idea. Um, on the theoretical side, we've seen that we don't just encounter SPTs, which are you know, a great tool that has come to us from condensed matter physics, but in particular, interesting examples of gapless SPTs, which is a much less explored uh, uh, regime, though many people, including Ryan, are working on it. And I think it's a great motivation to try to sharpen our understanding of that, that class of theories. All right, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks for a great talk. So, so what what will happen with this uh, conjectured singlet uh, baryon? It will become massless at that point. Not or? necessarily. It just it just needs to, roughly. If you think about it in a free fermion language, it just needs to change sign. And now, for a free mm -hmm. fermion to change sign, it has to go through zero. But in an interacting theory, you could imagine that, that the sign can just jump, jump discontinuously across a first order transition. Or it just becomes lighter than the octet somehow? Uh, no, it doesn't need to become lighter than the octet, but it, you need to activate it, right? Mm. You need to, you need to get, get to a scale where, where this, this thing can somehow, you need to overwhelm its initially bigger mass at zero density. And so you would expect that it doesn't kick in until, until pretty late. I mean, or the alternative is that there is no real sense in which you can think of this in, in, in a hadronic or confined language, and you should you just go deep into the quark regime. And like think in terms of di-quarks or something. Right. Like. All right. Uh, yeah, okay. Okay, it's probably uh, well known to you, but uh, as I said, no, compared with, they say, let's take uh, supersymmetric QCD no, in 3 plus 1, uh, you know, uh, the way it's like a flag died was like So there, a kind of uh, 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 scalar uh, partner of work plays a role of Higgs, and mm -hmm. the, the theory becomes, uh, you know, kind of, uh, um, kind of like the, in the Higgs phase. Mm -hmm. right? so, so you have vacuum marriage of this uh, right. scalar field, right, where, yeah, where, friend, uh, okay. However, the, no, and it is in the limit uh, in when mass uh, of quark is small, no, one flavor and mass of quark is much smaller than lambda. I mean, 
of the series. But, but I always view, view it as an example where you can compare this Higgs space and let's go to the limit where mass of quark is large, right? And then I, we would have just pure um, uh, supersymmetric Mills and we would say uh, it's a confined, uh, confined series, right? right? Uh, uh, Absolutely. Uh, I, yeah, so I'm trying to, com to compare it with what well, as I said. I had an explicit bullet point I'm listing supersymmetric examples as, as examples where we can really see Higgs confinement continuity with the naked eye, and this is an example. Yeah. And the reason is that every th parameter you tune is holomorphic. And yeah. So you can always avoid any possible phase transition by going around and dialing these parameters in the complex plane. Um, in those examples, you have absolutely no reason to restrict yourself to the kind of time reversal breaking special loci that I was discussing. So, so there's no SPT then? Uh, yeah, it's, it, you know, hol in holomorphy and the fact that you can always yeah. go around basically makes the notion of an SPT meaningless. I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you for a wonderful talk. So I had a question on slide 18. You had the Higgs in the... I, I don't know if I have slide 18 anymore. I could describe it to you. No, no, I'll find it, sorry. I okay. thought they had taken it away. Here it is. Okay, so you have the Higgs. So is this Higgs in the fundamental wrap of SU3 color? It's in the fundamental wrap of SU3 color and the fundamental wrap of SU3 flavor. Very good. And then, so my question is, so I was looking into breaking SU3 color in the future. Like, in, we already had one symmetry breaking in the past. I was looking into this in 2019, talking with George I about complementarity. My question is, did you break SU3 color with this Higgs down to an SU2? No. There are three Higgs fields, which, are, which you can organize into a square matrix and I'm taking the unit matrix. And that Higgs is SU3 color down to nothing. To nothing. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for a very uh, elegant analysis and particularly for your uh, discussion of Sherman Sen and uh, Yaffe. I just wanted to mention that I remember uh, discussing the consequences of having uh, superconductivity for an H dibaryon and I believe I argued that you had a first order transition, but it was the last millennium, so I forget the details. Well, you, so you certainly remember better than I. But I, I, my impression was that it's believed that the superfluid transition is first order everywhere, right? Uh, this was a separate transition associated with condensation of uh, Bob's H dibaryon. It was a new transition. But Which certainly sounds like what you're talking about. But, but this is the you're you're saying this is the transition that leads to superfluidity. Do you want to be? No, break? it's just associated with that H, dibaryon parameter. But the moment the H condenses, you break E one B. Right, right. I I believe it was above the usual. You're saying there might be a transition. In, a second one. There's, there's a transition at which the eights pair, and then a separate transition at which the H condenses. Yeah, something like that. So, it's possible because the H would couple to a putative singlet baryon yeah. bilinear that that could then explain the jump that I was talking about. So it would be great to talk more. Yeah. 